Microphone over here. If Steve is going to respond, I. He's not putting his hand up, but that guy had his hand up. Sorry. I was deliberately not putting my hand up. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting as a response to High Speed 3 in terms of connecting up the northern bands. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was uh, certainly also interested in the autonomous vehicles about connections into some, some of our stations, but uh, uh, I don't immediately feel threatened by it. <laughs> some questions. Who, who wants to ask a question of our, our speakers? Yeah. Sorry, I can't. Uh, the, the lights are very bright, so I'm sorry if I do know you. I can't recognise you. Uh, Glenn Lyons, UWE. Thank, thanks to Sarah and John for two fascinating presentations. Um, a very naive and simple question, I hope, for both of you, um, in terms of both human factors and ultimately the effectiveness of new systems which are not track-based. How do we overcome travel sickness? Uh, I can work on a train. I can't work on a coach. Uh, I can't even play a game on a coach. So, uh, in a past life, my PhD was on VR-induced motion sickness. So, actually, I, it's, it's something that, that exercises my mind quite a lot. So, um, so, we know the theory as to why sickness occurs, which is the conflict of information to our visual and our vestibular sensory systems. So, our visual system tells us we're moving, and our balance system tells us we're not, or vice versa, as is in the case with... Um, various vehicles. So there, there are ways to counteract it in terms of the visual information that's presented. Um, one of the things that we need to do is to allow our brain to anticipate the conflict that is being experienced. Um, we know the best way to explain this is that a driver is less experienced to experience, is less likely to experience sickness than a passenger because a driver is controlling the vehicle. But even if we do that, some people, and I'm one of those people, we found that 5% of people will experience significant sickness almost no matter what you do. Um, and I absolutely agree with you, actually, about Hyperloop, and I, I suspect you know more than I do about it, but, but that's the thing that scares me about Hyperloop, is the passenger experience of moving that quickly and the lack of ability to give a visual sense of motion. And even if you do, it would be so high that I think it would induce sickness anyway. So I think it is a real issue. Yeah, if I could just sort of add counterpoints to, to that. I, first off, this is a different way of travelling. So it's a series of five-minute or four-minute journeys. So you don't actually sit down, get your laptop out and start working for an hour, and you don't therefore get some of those motion sickness things that are attendant upon that. So it's a very different way of travelling, and very short distances I don't think have quite the same effect in terms of motion sickness. But we do have to watch the motion. Um, I didn't say, but should have said, that the, the way in which one might deploy this sort of futuristic shuttle system between our cities is, is again to go underground. Um, but, as I was showing in my early slides, the immersive environment opportunities are just the same. So you can have windows, or what are apparently windows, in the vehicle, and those windows can portray whatever you like, including the, the fields and the, the surface terrain that you would have been going over had you been on the surface. Um, how much would people enjoy going at 500 miles an hour in a small tube where you can't really see out the windows? Well, look at an aeroplane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really like flying very much. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So you are in one of these tubes flying along. It stops in the middle. Um, it catches fire. You haven't built another tunnel. What are you going to do? Is that happening? You make sense, well, you have to make provision for emergency escape. So just because you've got a single tunnel doesn't mean to say you can't have it provision for emergencies. But I would also say, here you are at 40,000 feet going over the mid-Atlantic at midnight, and that is in a little tube which is uh, full of kerosene and has two fires burning on each wing. Uh, if anything goes wrong with that, you're dead. But we do it all the time without thinking. And this state of mind is really my answer. at the back there. Thank you. Yes, Stephen Jersey from the Campaign for Better Transport. And you'd think from the name of the organisation we'd love all this, but actually better doesn't always mean faster and bigger. And um, I suppose the issue is what kind of places would Cambridge or indeed St Albans, um, uh, Declaration of Interest, I live there, um, and Watford become 
um, under these scenarios. The problem with the Abbey Line, which I know well, is not the, what you do between Watford and St Albans. It's the fact that Watford is a hellhole, which is really difficult to get into and park. And unless you do something, you either tunnel, your, you, have to, you have your tunnel, or you have to provide the bus priority that the, city, that the town has never been able to get through to, get, um, to, to actually make the places livable. So my point is that I can absolutely see how technology can reshape the way we travel. I'm not sure that all technologies will shape the way we live to the way that actually people want to live. And it seems to me that that's one of the, the that um, starting with the web tag five tech stage business case, the objectives that you, what you start with are the important ones. What kind of places do we want to create and live in? Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with you. I think the people issues are far more important than the technology issues. I use the Abbey Line only to illustrate that we could actually potentially build that solution today for that particular application. And what it would do it would simply make the system work better for a lower cost, which is not a bad place to be. But it doesn't answer the very fundamental question you asked. I was trying to work out where the... Where they transport hub would be in the middle of Market Square in, in the centre of Cambridge. I mean, you presume you've got to have an exit point as well. Uh, oh, yes. So the prices I gave include the hub station. It's under Parker's Peace, actually. Parker's Peace. Well, very you convenient for a manual. You put, you put the grass back, so I got the right. There. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Peter, I can see you. Yes. Just really a follow-on. Sorry. Really a follow-on from Stephen's point. Uh, most of the journeys that are made, and certainly the ones that are most problematic in transport and urban environmental terms, are relatively short distance, one, two, three miles, lots of people making lots of things, taking kids to school, picking something up from the supermarket, everybody trying to do everything all at once. What, so it's that seeming, and in a, in a dense urban environment, even worse if it's a historical one like Cambridge, what technologies are potentially out there that can help us address the real and the largest problem that we're actually faced with? Well, Sorry. well yeah, but maybe that's the human factor. I mean, maybe uh -huh. Sarah would say, why do we have any, not understanding the merits of cycling, why do only 2% of people cycle? So, so my answer would, would actually be um, around information. So. I think there are, there are some challenges because of the nature of this country, the densely populated areas that we have. The, uh, the nature of the working day, actually, is a real challenge, the peaks of travel. Um, so, so I think the first thing is that people are much more comfortable with a delayed journey if they know they're going to have a delayed journey. Um, and I mean, when speaking to, I don't know if there's anyone here from the Highways Agency, when he introduced the travel time information on the motorways, they were, they were really a tremendous PR success. Um, and, uh, and made people feel much more confident about traveling on the motorway because they knew how long it was going to be between junction A and junction B. So we know that people are much more able to cope with delays if they know those delays are happening. Um, behavior change is much more problematic, and I would say there's two things that we need to address in your scenario. The first is change in modality, so walking to school, cycling, um, and uh, essentially reducing the traffic on the road. But the second is looking to see whether, from a societal point of view, we can actually manage those pinch points. So why, why does the school day start at the same time as a working day? It's a nightmare for all of us to have to get all members of the family to the same place at the same time. So how can we actually look more courageously at those sorts of things? That's, that's not a job for me, actually. That's, I'm not quite sure who that is a job for, but that's a really tricky thing. But that would, that would be the thing that would really solve the problem. Yes, and if I could add to that, um, I made the point early in my um, presentation about the addition of Brownian motion and tidal flow. And I think you were drawing attention to the Brownian motion type of event. I think there's a lot of stuff going on in that space, but to keep it very brief, if we were looking at the tidal flow problem as I described it in Cambridge, we end up, as I suggested, taking something like uh, 20,000 cars in the morning out of the system and the same number in the evening as they return. So 20,000 cars off the roads in Cambridge, if that system was to work, what that does is it gives space then for the Brownian motion systems to come in and things like demand responsive transport, on-demand bus, uh, Uber, pool, these things which are information-based then have a lot more freedom to run around, but not to forget 
that the shuttle system is actually predicated on stations that are about two to three miles apart. So it's quite practical to come out of any one of those stations and walk to the midpoint. It's only a mile, mile and a half. That is walking and cycling territory. Look, I think I'm going to draw this to a conclusion. We've started to lose some of our, our guests because we have run over time. Uh, I'm going to just thank you both very much uh, for, for, for joining us, for stimulating a discussion which will continue for those who are able to stay over a, a, a few drinks and a few more canapé, in, uh, and I can recommend it significantly, making the modern world hall. Uh, I think it's in that direction when we go out. Can't quite visualise where I'm pointing uh, in the Science Museum. Um, I'd like to thank again uh, uh, the Science Museum for, for making this facility available, particularly Mary Archer, who in this context is one of the very few people to have an old-fashioned road named after her in the last year in Cambridge, uh, and uh, Jonathan Newby. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, hope to see you soon again. And uh, let's move on to, uh, to a few drinks, and you can continue the discussion. There. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.